My name's Tim Bryant. I'm the uh, Director of Research in the Department of the Senate. Regular attendees will have noticed that I'm not Dr Rosemary Lang, Clerk of the Senate. Dr Lang's recently retired, uh, and so we'll be doing things slightly, slightly differently in 2017, but we still hope to bring you a good 10 or so excellent lectures, and I think we've got one of those today. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay respect to all of Australia's Indigenous elders, past and present. We originally approached Professor Jackman about this lecture in the immediate aftermath of the US election last November. Part of that invitation said that we would be very pleased to hear your observations from the relatively calmer waters of February 2017. We will still be very pleased to hear Professor Jackman's observations, <laughs> but I'm not sure that February 2017 could be classified as relatively calmer waters. It's certainly been an extraordinary few months. Professor Jackman is currently the CEO of the United States Study Centre at the University of Sydney. Previously, he was a professor of political science and statistics at Stanford University. He has published widely in the areas of public opinion, election campaigns and political participation. I look forward to hearing his insights into populism, discontent, and US-Australian relations. Please join with me in welcoming Professor Simon Jackman. Quite a lot of water now. Um, thank you uh, for that introduction, and, and it's uh, really a great honor um, to be asked to come and, and, and speak uh, in this building. Um, um, I was here before the election, uh, where our friends from the Parliamentary Library will remember that I, I tipped Hillary Clinton to win the election and um, <laughs> she won the popular vote. Um, um, so, so what I'll do today is try and keep my remarks rather short. My experience with talks like this, both before the election and afterwards, is that um, you will have a lot of questions perhaps and um, I'll do my best to, to try and answer them. The tempo of politics in the United States and their implications for Australia um, are, are, are sort of front of mind uh, for me as I was, I was on my way up uh, this morning and, and, and thinking about, about the talk. So um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll say a few words about, you know, are we living through a populist moment? I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the US election um, and, and you know, challenge, I think, some of the conventional interpretations of it. I'll, I'll do some Australian comparisons. There won't be a lot there, but I hope you find them um, provocative. Um, and, and I'm going to conclude, and, and this is the, really the point of comparison um, between American political institutions that both enable and, and inhibit uh, uh, populism, if you will. Uh, and, and similarly for Australia, and, and at that point I'd like to sort of stop and, 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 and um, maybe we can get into some back and forth about any of the above or, or like I said, when I give talks lately, it's uh, very much audiences are very engaged with, um, with the state of American politics and what, what that implies for, for our relationship with the United States and perhaps uh, the planet. <laughs> um, so, so let's get going. Um, so what is populism? I think if you're going to come out and uh, put that on the, on the title of your talk, it might, it might, be, uh, it might be on you to sort of uh, define the term. Um, I'm going to you know, use a relatively standard definition. It's like many things in political science. There is no one definition that, that, the, that the profession uh, hews to. Um, but populism is, is you know, a political appeal um, based on a, a worldview uh, of, of a contest between masses and, and elites um, that transcends uh, ordinary uh, political com uh, competition. And often the populist uh, or, or the populist party or the populist candidate claims to be, you know, the authentic expression of national spirit, of, of the true preferences of the people. Uh, and, and feel free to insert the word the Volk uh, 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 there. Definitely, and I think this is part of the, the trouble in, in, the, in the political science profession, as that little aside of mine just reveals, we often find ourselves sliding very quickly, you know, authoritarianism or fascism, very quickly people want to start sliding those words in. And I think it, it's important, though, to be as precise as one can about these things. Um, and so I, I'm going to you know, not engage in that as, as best as I can. 
um, um, and, and keep this fairly firmly focused on, on populism as, as, a, as an electoral um, uh, phenomenon. Um, and it's also, populism is also um, distinguished by uh, the claim that politics as usual is unable to save pressing national problems. That the decision-making apparatus of the state, be it electoral institutions, legislative institutions, the bureaucracy uh, has been captured by some inauthentic interest and insert what you will, big business, a, a worldview, a neoliberal economic orthodoxy, uh, a communist uh, economic orthodoxy, you know, international financiers, whoever they may be, technocrats, bureaucrats, there's, there's something gumming up the works that's getting in the way of the true authentic expression of national will and, 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 and policy. And it requires things to be shaken up and it doesn't, and, and finds real expression in it doesn't matter who you elect, you get the same sorts of policy outcomes. Um, a charismatic leader is often involved, although I wouldn't sort of make that uh, a necessary condition um, you know, for a party to be popular, although history uh, certainly, um, uh, the two do seem to go together. Um, the ability to make this claim, uh, successfully at least, often turns on the ability of a, of a person to head the movement and make this claim and to be the bearer of, of, of a breakthrough uh, that will, will, will unjam the works. Um, and so, Exhibit A, I would tell you, yes, Trump, why was Trump, why is it fair to call Trump a populist? Because in particular, his repudiation of, of um, the liberal internationalist orthodoxy that has been, you know, presidential candidates from both sides of American politics for decades have talked about the virtues of free trade, have talked about uh, uh, the virtue of American leadership in the world. Um, and, and when Trump's nomination speech uh, was the first time, certainly in my uh, living memory, um, that I've heard uh, a nominee of a major party in that nomination speech say, that's not what I'm about. And indeed, that's a sellout of, of the working class. And, and by the way, those of you thinking of voting for Hillary Clinton, she is going to keep going down that road that has led to bad outcomes for you and your families. And I, I intend to do something different. Um, that was a real break. Mitt Romney was not saying things like that. John McCain was not saying things like that. John McCain was one of the bipartisan leaders uh, with Joe Biden. It was a McCain-Biden coalition, essentially, across the aisle that passed NAFTA, that saw the expansion of NATO, that admitted the Czech Republic to NATO, for instance. A bunch of those, when the American Congress has acted in an internationalist direction, it's often been on the back of a bipartisan coalition that has seen the extremes of both parties voting no, and, and the, 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 the yes coalition being brokered by states people, uh, uh, Biden and, and McCain in, in, the, uh, in the 90s, um, really leading um, a bipartisan coalition to, to get those things done. Trump is not about that, nor is the contemporary US Congress for that matter. Uh, um, now in the Australian context, um, I think you know, there are plenty of examples and I'll return to them. The one I'll, I'll, I'll you know, put on a slide uh, in deference to, to people that work uh, not too far away from here, um, is the Democrats appeal based on keeping the bastards on us, right? You know, what, there's a lot wrapped up in that statement. They are bastards, right? Not a good thing. Uh, that's a uh, pejorative. Um, um, and we're here to keep, it's not about a policy per se. Right? It's about process, right? And, 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 and about them, the defined in opposition to them. Um, and, um, and, and we might, you know, I invite you, I won't do it today, but invite you to think about how some of the appeals of uh, contemporary Australian uh, minor parties um, are of a similar ilk. And we'll, we'll turn to that later, perhaps. Um, so, so, yes, uh, Trump is, is populist, and, I would, and, I'd, and I'd say uh, some of the people currently in, in the Australian Senate um, um, in particular um, um, pick up on similar um, on similar themes, um, um, that, that um, um, the major parties are not giving authentic voice uh, to, to, to what the people want, whatever that might be. Um, that they policy outputs have been captured by other interests that neither party is able to transcend. That, that is a theme 
to be sure, in, in contemporary Australian politics as well. Um, so now I'm going to flip gears a little, having sort of set the stage a little bit um, on just my retrospective on, on the American election. Um, now, the US election is often hailed as a, as a, as a populist triumph. Uh, the, the, the Rust Belt working class rose up and, and, and tossed out, tossed out um, uh, embraced Trump's uh, message. Um, yes, but no. I think it is, it's very easy to overread um, the result. It's very easy to overread the result given how vivid and how huge a presence Trump is in national media. Um, uh, it is very much in Trump's interest that people continue to think that, right? And his outsized media presence um, is, is part of the, of the magic, if you will. But, but let's turn to the data. Um, so, of course, um, the thing I do take some comfort from wearing my pollster hat is uh, that uh, Clinton did win the popular vote uh, by, by, by 2.87 million uh, votes. Um, that's a 2.1% margin. And indeed, from that perspective, the national polls, although wrong in terms of the magnitude, certainly got the outcome correct. Um, um, in two-party terms, Clinton beat Trump 51.1 to 48.9. Now, Australian politics occasionally throws up those mismatches between the national two-party preferred vote and the seat outcome, uh, the two most vivid recent examples being 1998, uh, where, where Labor outpolled the coalition in two-party preferred terms, but uh, John Howard uh, won it in the right places and the famous GST. And the other one was 1990, where Labor did it to, to the coalition. And there are examples earlier, uh, although the two-party preferred figures are a little rubbery uh, once you go back in the 50s uh, in Australia. But, but, but this outcome is far in excess of... They've been real, when it's happened in Australia, they've been real nail-biters, 50.1. Well, 51 at most, but, but 51.1 um, is, is, is really uh, quite stupendous uh, to then go on and not win the Electoral College. Um, that margin, Clinton's margin, is bigger than the margin of Al Gore, who suffered a similar fate, won the vote but lost the Electoral College, Richard Nixon and John Kennedy, who squeaked over the line in, in 1960. Um, important to keep that in perspective. Uh, the Electoral College went 304, 227 and seven so-called faithless electors. Um, uh, who voted for others. Uh, Clinton won 20 states of, of uh, 50 plus the District of Columbia and one electoral vote in Maine, which Maine, of course, does not use the winner-take-all formulation. It's winner-take-all in each of its congressional seats. But ev with the exception of Maine and Nebraska, the rest of the United States, it's a winner-take-all system. It's very brutal in that way. It's, it's, it's a harshly majoritarian electoral mechanism. Um, and, and, and is capable, as we've seen, of producing results like the one we, we got in 2016 and 2000. So how did that outcome come about? It came about um, because of this um, fact that the Democrats ran up the clock, ran up the score, if you will, pardon me, in, 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 in some big states. So Hillary Clinton beats Trump by 30 points. It was a 65-35 election in California. In fact, Clinton's margin there, by the way, exceeds um, both of Obama's wins there. California went the other way. Um, really remarkable result. Clinton, Clinton wins that state with, by uh, 4.27 million votes, which are effectively wasted. If she'd won California by one vote, she would have got 55 of its electoral college votes. Winning it, it would have been great if some of those 4.3 million Californians had taken up residence in other states from her perspective. <laughs> um, um, um. And a similar story holds for New York, a huge margin there, Illinois. These are big, Democra big, big democratic states, Illinois, Massachusetts. You go to Texas, that's about Trump's only lopsided win, big state lopsided win, where, where the wasted votes, if you will, amount to only 800,000 votes. And, and interestingly, uh, thinking about the future of American politics, the margin there was less than 10 points, uh, which a lot of people took notice of and perhaps a harbinger uh, that, that uh, demographic shifts may be slowly dragging Texas in a less Republican, more Democratic direction, but that's another story. But the tale of the tape here is the way that Democratic vote 
is just literally overpowering in states. And, and when you overlay that on top of this harshly majoritarian electoral mechanism, this is sort of a key building block as to how we got the mismatch between the popular vote and the Electoral College vote. Trump won the election very efficiently, if you will, is perhaps the other way to think about this. Trump uh, wins three states in particular, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, by razor thin margins. Um, had 77,000 votes um, stayed home, or half of that number, change their minds, go on the other way, um, we'd be talking about President Hillary Clinton and how the genius of her analytical team threaded the needle and da da da, da right? right? So when an election, and you know, I'm, I'm basing this on 2000 as well, when an election is this close, everything becomes relevant. The FBI did it. It was a bad, Hillary Clinton made bad campaign decisions. She should have never used the word deplorables. You know, there's, like, keep going. When we're talking about changing, what is that, half of 77,000 votes, or, or 77,000 people staying home, I think we're at the limits of anything we might reasonably call political science at that point. Um, uh, our, our resolution um, with our theories of voting, um, um, data, the whole kind of apparatus, if you will, just is, is going to really struggle to explain 0.06%. Um, um, of the vote. And when you're in that world, everything mattered, and perhaps hence nothing mattered, <laughs> or at the very least, it's just very, very hard to say. Um, um, that said, you shouldn't take too much away from Trump. It's important to recognize um, the wins in Ohio, typically the bellwether state in, 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 um, in American elections has gone with the winner in every election now. Uh, um, since 1964, John Kennedy was the last person to win the White House without winning Ohio. Um, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a solid win um, by any stretch of the imagination for Trump in Ohio. Iowa, a state that Obama carried twice, um, the idea that um, that is now on a 9.4 margin for Trump, that, that's, that's an electoral catastrophe um, for, for, for Clinton and her campaign. Uh, Florida was, was line ball, was the last state over the line for Obama in 2012. And, and again, that only 1.2% the other way. But those wins in Ohio and uh, Iowa, uh, you shouldn't take anything away from Donald Trump on that. And indeed, Minnesota came perilously close to, to flipping. Um, Minnesota, you know, often thought to be a, a democratic stronghold, um, a state that gave us Hubert Humphrey, that gave us Walter Mondale. Um, 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 the idea that Trump got as close as he did in Minnesota is, is sort of um, pretty impressive, uh, and New Hampshire, for that matter, is pretty impressive. Um, but I look at these data and, and go, yes, big swings in some of these states, uh, in many of these states, um, but, but don't overread it. Uh, um, and indeed, I think this speaks to, to Trump's challenge in 2020. Um, 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 rebuilding this coalition um, and, and hoping that the people that stayed home stay home uh, as well as the people that came out for him um, come out again. It'll, it'll, um, pulling this trick off twice will be quite the feat. Um, okay. Um, the story is largely in those states um, about what happened in the countryside. Um, so there's a lot of information here. I've got eight states. And, and what I've done on the horizontal axis, I've plotted Obama's share of the vote from 2012 by county uh, against Clinton's share of the vote from 2016. And if the election was a rerun, if 16 was a rerun of 12, uh, any engineers in the room will know those data should lie on a 45 degree line. And that's what that black slander line is. You see all the dots have come down below the line, and that, that, that reflects the extent to which Clinton is underperforming. Uh, yes, Clinton is underperforming Obama. The other piece of information is the size of the, of the circle, and that reflects the population of each of these counties. So the little ones are these small rural counties, and, and the bigger ones, um, well, Illinois, that'll be Chicago, right? This will be Detroit. This is Philadelphia. Here's Milwaukee, 
and Madison. Uh, there's Minneapolis. Here's Cleveland, right? And you can see in a lot of these places, I mean, Michigan, yes, all the dots have slid down a bit, but boy, oh boy, that turnout not coming back in Detroit really hurt. And Detroit, of course, huge city, uh, huge African-American population. But the real story here is the way the countryside um, uh, you know, swung hard. Um, generally speaking, um, the smaller dots, the rural dots, the rural counties have swung harder uh, than, than the cities. Um, and, and the vote for Clinton didn't hold up enough. And again, those three states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, um, would have been enough to tilt the election. And boy, if Pennsylvania could have just come back up a little closer to the line, same thing. So, but the, the real story of this election, though, is what happened out in these rural counties. I'm going to take a, uh, another look at that in the next, next slide. Um, this is um, every county in the US. Um, and, and this is um, just giving you a sense of how the, what the current configuration of um, American politics looks like. And indeed, not just the current configuration, but this is a, if I'd made this picture with the 12 data or the eight data, um, it would look not substantially different. This is just showing you on the vertical axis, Clinton's vote share against the population density of the county. So it's kind of trying to measure how urban or how rural it is. So these are big population places. That's Queens County, New York. There's San Francisco County. These are, these are, there's the Bronx. There's Kings County, uh, Yonkers and, and part of the, uh, the greater New York. Um, and there's New York County. So, you know, big populations, uh, high, and so um, high density, over 25,000 people per square uh, kilometre. And, and, you know, those data slant up, right, meaning the cities vote overwhelmingly for Clinton. Look at this, the vote share up here, Clinton is winning Bronx County 90-10. Right, it sort of emphasises that pattern uh, we saw before. Uh, we're up over 80% on the vertical axis here. And these are small rural counties where... Um, Clinton is doing very badly. Um, and then there's a few odd ones. Um, that's Native American land um, um, in, in, in South Dakota. And, and, and that's suburban New York where um, it's um, richer people, uh, outer suburbs of, uh, of, of, of New York where, where Clinton loses, but still reasonably dense population. But, but this is the big story of American politics. It's, at the moment, it's cities versus the hinterland. And that maps onto that populist uh, story um, I, was, I was, or description I was providing earlier. Um, that out in the countryside resigns the authentic nature of America, that the cities uh, are cosmopolitan, uh, multiracial, um, um, integrated into the world economy, um, full of people who weren't born uh, in, in the United States. And, um, and, and that's, that, this, this chart, the one thing that is different about this chart from earlier years is that the pattern has gotten sort of more pronounced, if you will. Over the last couple of cycles, um, this sort of correlation between population density and how democratic a place is has, has gotten tighter and tighter and tighter. So it's a big part of the story. Um, I'll skip that. Um, this, this sort of repeats the story too, and this is, the, this is turnout now um, with that same representation, trying to zoom in on, on, the, on the rural counties in those, in those key swing states. And here, this is change in turnout on change in vote, if you will. And again, with the size of the plotting symbol revealing, um, the, uh, indicating whether we're talking about a rural place or an urban place. And most of these lines slope down and the point there is that as, as turnout went up, support for Clinton went down. Right? So Trump is bringing out voters is essentially the story here, right? That is, I would tell you that's probably two thirds or three quarters of the story is a mobilization story. A set of voters who, who sat out for the most part the last couple of presidential elections but Trump spoke to them and got people who typically are not the most reliable of voters, probably sat out the last two elections and, and turned, and, and in particular, in small circle places, in, in rural counties. Um, there's a few exceptions to the pattern, but, but generally that, that is the story. 
um, um, increasing turnout typically associated with uh, declining vote share um, or the swing being towards Trump being, being larger and, and more pronounced in those, in those rural, uh, rural counties. A um, few observations um, that sort of parallel this. Uh, what happened in Congress? Um, so Clinton won a majority of the popular vote um, in, the, in, the, in the, but so did House Democrats. Um, um, well, at least put it this way, Republicans didn't win a majority, I think is the more accurate statement. Republicans didn't win a majority of the, um, of the, um, of the House vote, uh, but nonetheless have a thumping majority in the House. Which again is one of these things. Um, you know, the, the, remember this, where we're going to end this talk is, is to sort of talk about the primacy of political institutions here, institutions that essentially govern the mapping of preferences into who sits in Parliament or Congress or the White House and, and makes policy. Um, how can it be that with 49% of the vote they end up with 66, 67% of the seats? Um, the answer is the Democratic vote is packed. Uh, and by that, uh, I mean it's, if you will, a small-scale version of that story I told you about the states. California is a blue state. It has a surplus, in a political sense, of Democratic voters. But so, too, do many House districts. It's very, it's very tempting to draw a district, particularly if you're a Republican, by the way, to draw a district that sits neatly over the Bronx, and you've created a 90-10 Democratic district. And by the way, the Democratic member of Congress there, he doesn't mind that, or she doesn't mind that. It's not a bad outcome for them. But for the Democratic Party, more, that's not a good outcome, right? And it's a little bit cheeky, frankly. There's a little bit, oh, but we're sending African Americans and Hispanics to Congress. Good thing, right? Oh, wow, you Republicans are just such warm-hearted people. Uh, your commitment to racial equality is just fantastic. Um, and there's a little bit of that going on. And it's an interesting political tension inside the Democratic Party, by the way, because it does speak to that. It, two things are being put in, in opposition. A commitment to getting faces of color into the US Congress, a laudable goal, an important one. But if it's coming at the cost of packing votes, right, um, and, and, and meaning that the Democratic vote is spread very inefficiently and indeed capable of creating outcomes like this where, where Republicans can win um, a huge chunk of the seats even though they, they get you know, significantly below um, you know, that proportion of, of uh, a corresponding proportion of the vote. Now, there's nothing that says we ought to have proportional representation uh, and, and that's a topic for another day perhaps um, the, the, the theoretical merits of, of PR, uh, but if you, and indeed, if you have a single, if you have a district system, you will have a pretty steep, right, small changes in vote will produce big changes in, in seat share, but mismatches like this um, uh, are perhaps sort of not what you'd want to see, at least not too often, but right now this is sort of hardwired into uh, American politics, uh, and the mechanism is, is um, that Redistricting in the United States, as it's called, we call it redistribution. See, redistricting is a partisan affair, largely, in the United States. There are some exceptions. California switched to a partisan districting, uh, a citizens commission uh, for, for, uh, for districting. Um, but in the, the default, until a state legislature hands that power away or the citizens take it away through a, a referendum, to the, an amendment to the state constitution, if you will, that power vests in the state legislature. So imagine for a moment the New South Wales Parliament has responsibility for New South Wales House of Rep seats in this place, drawing the lines that would do that. Or well, the Queensland Parliament gets to draw the lines for, for Queensland's uh, House of Representative seats here. The temptation to get partisan with that is overwhelming and has been irresistible um, in, in contemporary American politics. Um, the fact of the matter is you do it in two steps. First, you gerrymander the state legislature, protect yourself. Once you've got control of that, you then gerrymander the House of Reps seats and, and sort of hardwire in results like this for at least a decade. So in the United States, a census comes in the zero, zero year. Um, the the uh, districts are redrawn in time for the next 
for the two election in, the, in a, in a decade-long cycle, uh, and sort of, sort of midway through that right now. And Republicans, um, um, this is part, a big part of the story. And, and why am I bringing this up in this talk about populism? Because it, it, it gives Republicans uh, in Congress um, power, and indeed certain elements of the Republican Party, populist, more populist elements, more power to make policy than would correspond to their electoral strength in, in raw national numerical terms. Another thing I think it's important for Australian audiences, and indeed American audiences uh, for that matter, to, to keep in mind. North Carolina is a state I'm doing some research on at the moment. In 2016, Democrats won three out of 13 uh, uh, seats. They won 48% um, um, of the vote statewide and will do three for 13. And uh, in each of the three seats they won, they won by more than 6733. Right. Again, the incumbents there go, nice. There's only three of us, but it's not too, right? They're democratic, right? And, 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 and the, the euphemism for this is packing and cracking. Um, um, you, you pack your opponent's votes uh, and then you crack them as well, dis disperse the remainders, uh, create a moderately safe seats for yourself and create a, a small number of whoppingly safe seats for your opponents to lock up their vote. Um, um, so that's part of the story with Congress. A um, qu few quick observations on the American Senate. Um, that's a very interesting place at the moment. Uh, if you've been following news accounts of what's coming out of the United States, there's a 52-48 split there. Um, the filibuster is this rule in the American Senate that you need 60 votes to call debate to a close. So, so 41 senators can dig their heels in and say, procedurally, we're not ready to vote. And, um, and so... Um, um, right now, Republicans are eight short. Um, so there's eight to nine Democratic senators right now are incredibly powerful. Um, there's a short circuit for the majority, and that is to lump a lot of legislation into the budget reconciliation process. There's one thing that's been carved out is kind of filibuster proof. Um, but that's really slow, and I think it's going to create some real tension inside the American political system um, right now, uh, well, maybe we can talk about that in Q&A, but I'll, I'll keep moving because I want to finish by a few observations about Australia. Um, so a couple of things in Australia, um, you'd think this guy could spell compulsory, but um, that's all right. Um, um, compulsory voting pushes turnout um, above 90% here. Um, we used to think it was well above 90% until we figured out the Electoral Commission started computing the denominator the right way. And, uh, and we figured out there are a lot of people out there who actually aren't, uh, uh, who ought to be enrolled and are now enrolled, but, but don't vote. And the, and the more realistic turnout, I think I used to go around the world saying Australia has voter turnout above 95%. I think somewhere between 90 and 95%, I think is perhaps the more uh, credible uh, number. Um, now, what that means is that the alienated must vote in Australia or, 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 or not. But I'm thinking of my dad up in Queensland, um, very unscientific of me now. Um, uh, what, what, what's the old saying? Data is the plural uh, anecdote of uh, anecdote, yeah. <laughs> but um, but um, my dad uh, is uh, now 81 years old and, uh, and is fed up. I would really, says the only reason he votes is because they're gonna fine him. And to hell with it, he's gonna vote non-conventionally, shall, shall we say. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a bit of his uh, getting back at the system. Um, I'm not sure if he, I think he, I'm, I haven't talked to him for a while about this, but that was certainly his state of mind um, a couple of election cycles ago. Um, and what that does in Australia, it produces a steady supply for none of the above, right? And it's something that in the American system, if you're alienated and upset, you don't have to vote. And indeed, it's a Tuesday. You might have other things to do that day than vote for these people you don't really like, right? It's a much different sort of system for that reason. Um, the other thing to note is that the voting system we have for the, for the Senate, uh, transferable vote, and perhaps especially at double dissolution, election, uh, double dissolution elections, provides a pathway. What, if I was an economist, I'd call that low entry costs, right? For, for political entrepreneurs, seeking to exploit the fact that compulsory voting is, is generating this supply of voters, or if you turn it around, a demand for them, if you will. 
Um, it's interesting thinking about uh, preferential voting, or what we sometimes call the alternative vote, um, in, in House of Rep selections in Australia. Alienated voters going to a minor party, none of the above, mad as hell type candidate, um, those preferences can come back. Um, it's a little unseemly, as we're currently seeing with respect to Western Australia, the deal making that sometimes has to go on to try and secure a flow of those preferences to come back. But that's probably better if you're a politician than having to seek bringing those people back all together. If, there was, if it was first preference or nothing, you know, let them vote second and we'll do this deal. Maybe they'll forget about it by election day or they won't look at how I vote cards too, too serious. Right? Maybe you know, it's a little more palatable and, 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 and allows the management, if you will, um, of, of candidates chasing these votes in the House at least um, a, a little more easily. But the Senate, different story. Uh, so I'll take a, I'll show you one thing. Um, so this is, um, I've got to say, this is inspired by some analysis I saw um, the very clever and hardworking people at the Grattan Institute in Melbourne doing, um, and I thought I'd do this for myself. The AEC, you've got to love the AEC. You can go onto their website and you can download all this data, and, and, um, and not only that, they geocode polling places for you. It's, I've got to tell you, it's... Um, Thank you, AEC, uh, for making research into Australian elections so easy uh, compared to doing this for the United States requires, um, you know, half a million dollars of NSF money to round up the data in the first place from all the counties and states and whatnot, whereas you just click a mouse here uh, and, and you can do it. So what am I showing you? What I'm showing you is vote for in Senate elections by polling place, so there's a lot of data, right? Each, each circle there is a polling place. And I've, and I've coded two things for each polling place. How much of the vote cast for Senate at a given polling place went to someone other than the Coalition, Labor, or the Greens? So I'm calling the Greens a major party here. And, and we might quibble with that, but just go with it for the time being. So you know who, I'm who, who, I'm, who we're measuring. So it's all the others, right? And the other, what I've plotted on the horizontal axis is how far that polling place is from the GPO in that state. Right. And the first time I saw this analysis, I was sitting in, in Melbourne at the Grattan Institute, um, and, it's, and it's pretty interesting. This is from 2016, uh, July 2016. Um, uh, and again, because the Greens is uh, you know, largely concentrated in urban areas, um, 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 in fact, the green vote almost goes to zero um, once you get more than 10k away from a GPO uh, in, 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 in most places, uh, Nimbin uh, being an exception, but never mind. Um, um, uh, um, Mullumbimby. Um, but, but the way that, again, you know, I showed you a bunch of data from the United States, the countryside, the hinterland being on fire. Um, if you want, this is the closest quick thing I could come up with to, to a demonstration of this, a dissatisfaction with what's being offered up by the major parties and a willingness to entertain voting for somewhere else. I want to draw attention to how high these numbers are getting. Right? We're up over 40% in some places. Comfortably, a lot of this data is above a third in New South Wales. Once we get out 100, 500 kilometres away from Sydney, Look at Queensland, right, and it dips down here. These are some of the, Queensland isn't perhaps the best way to do this. It's the most decentralized state in Australia. Um, but nonetheless, look at this, where there's a, quite a few places, polling places in Queensland where others are getting 50% of the, this is in 2016, right? This is, we'll see how, what this looks like the next time around. Um, and, and a similar pattern elsewhere, perhaps a little less pronounced. And of course, Queensland here, we're picking up on on the return of, of Pauline Hanson um, to, to Australian politics um, uh, there. Um, but this is perhaps, uh, there's been a bit of polling data uh, talked about in the last couple of weeks, but I thought I'd go back and, and present data from the, um, from the last election um, uh, on this. Um, and moreover, the version of this I saw done at Grattan um, repeats this analysis for 16, 13, 10, 7, 4, last sequence of Australian elections. And it's just going up and up. The pattern is there, but it's like it just, it just keeps ratcheting up each, each, each cycle. Um, it's not so much 
I don't know how far away you people live from the ACT GPA, but, uh, um, but, but um, it may not be people in this room necessarily um, who live these distances away from, from, from a major urban um, uh, area, uh, but, but out in the countryside, um, willingness to entertain uh, unconventional candidates, shall we say, is, has, has always been stronger than the city, at least for the last couple of decades, but is, but is increasing. Uh, um, and, the, and, and moreover, we have a set of electoral mechanisms in Australia that allow people ex these people capturing this vote to find their way uh, in, in, into the national parliament. Two things to finish on. Um, the last uh, Australian election survey, this is a survey that's run out of the Australian National University by Ian McAllister, um, asks people if they favour compulsory voting or not. And, um, and you get... These numbers are starting to trickle down. I looked at these numbers about 20 years ago. They were much stronger. Um, support for compulsory voting is starting to fade a little bit. Um, only 49% strongly favour compulsory voting. I guess if you put the two um, um, weakest categories together, you're up to, what is that, 28% starting to... And then you ask people themselves, would you have voted if it hadn't been compulsory? And only 64%, less than two-thirds, are saying they definitely would have voted. And I'd tell you that that's an upper bound, by the way, because these are people who are taking a long survey in the mail about politics. They're sort of into politics, right? They're so into politics, they're willing to take this long survey, and only 64% of them say they definitely would have voted, right? They didn't get any incentive to take this survey. This big booklet arrives in the mail with a nice letter from Ian McAllister saying, would you take my survey? It's for science, and, and a lot of people do it. Um, and the other thing is to say you wouldn't have voted, that's kind of a little subversive in Australia, even privately on a survey. But, it, you know, we have a norm of, of civic participation that's found voice in the, in the Commonwealth Electoral Act. Um, and and to, to go against that is, is a little unusual. Um, so I would tell you that out there in the wild, if you will, um, um, it, this number is even smaller than 64%. Then I've done two things. I've tabulated who they said they voted for in the election by how they answered that question about voting. And then I did that breakdown of vote by the way I did it before, combining major parties and Greens with others. And the point is, this is sort of to buttress my claim about, about uh, where that vote is, is, um, is coming from. Um, definitely would have voted splits 92-8 for major parties plus green versus others. This is when they tell us about who they voted for. By the time you get down to definitely, I, no way I would have voted, that voting for other candidates is up now to 30%. Right. And here's the story from the Senate, it's even more stark. Right. Among that subset of people who say, I definitely, in a survey, I'm, tell, I'm taking this survey, but I'm telling you, I definitely wouldn't have voted. Right. It's basically 50-50 voting for these other non-conventional candidates and parties uh, in, in a Senate vote. So on balance, I'm a fan of compulsory voting. I think it keeps a lot of money out of Australian politics for one thing, um, which having lived in America for a long time, I tend to think on balance is a good thing. But these data, and we, as we think about the current configuration, of Australian politics and maybe frustration uh, that of the inability uh, of governments to, uh, to get policy through, um, maybe this gives us some reason to contemplate the, the flip side of compulsory voting, that demand it generates, that supply, if you will, it generates of voters willing uh, to vote for, quote, non-conventional candidates. It's something to think about, I think, something that we we often don't think about. I think rightly hold up compulsory voting as one of the stronger facets of, of Australian electoral democracy. Um, but there may be some sting in the tail. Um, so, you know, what's the takeaway? Institutions matter. Um, I presume you sort of believe that before you came in today, but they matter in different ways in the US, different institutions, winner take all. Uh, in the Republican primary process, something we didn't talk much about, help, Republican, help Trump get the nomination. And then winner take all in electoral college generated that mismatch between the popular vote, uh, helped generate the mismatch between the popular vote and the election outcome. Um, in Australia, we've got some institutions too. 
We've got a whole bunch of them. Compulsory voting, different electoral systems for House and Senate. Um, and I think we need to think through what role they are playing in the translation of alienation and, and, and people being upset with the system and how that finds political voice uh, in, in, in the national parliament. And, um, and at that point, I'll leave it at that. And, uh, and I think we've got microphones out on the, on the, on the sides there. And if, so if anybody wanted to get cracking on, on any q and I'd be more than willing to do that for a little while um, at this point. Thank you very much. Now, just in relation to the microphones, this theatre is a little steep. Uh, so it's best if you put your hand up if you can, and we'll bring a microphone to you, um, unless you're already halfway there. Uh, <laughs> because moving around can be a little dangerous. Um, and the lights in here are a little brutal. I can sort of see silhouettes. Um, so once the people who are at the microphones have uh, asked their questions, put your hand up and we'll bring a microphone to you. So uh, here first. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, I'm an American who's been living in Australia for a long time. I'm an old political science major as well. So I've had a keen interest in what's going on and I like everyone else, I think, I've been trying to understand it. You talked about um, the urban-rural split. And I think I saw some stats that came out that also talked about the educational split. I guess my, my two questions are, to what extent do you think the urban-rural split was a proxy for education? Um, because I, I think tertiary educated people were more likely to vote for Clinton, for example. And, and I guess also um, thinking about the actual voters, how they voted and why, I'm just wondering whether there was any pre or post election um, opinion polling that says whether, like Brexit, people were actually voting for Trump largely to send a message without actually expecting or wanting him to win. Wow, um, okay. So on the first thing about education, um, uh, yes and yes, I suppose. Um, it is a fact that um, um, you will find more college educated people in, in cities but it is still a fact that, um, and important for Australian audiences to remember this, that getting a college degree is way more common um, in, in the United States than here. And you will find plenty of college educated people in rural areas who vote um, for, for, voted for Trump. Um, it, it's not, it, it goes down, but it, it, it is not a hard deterministic rule. College degree equals Democrat or equals urban dweller Democrat. Um, um, and, and, the, and the way to look at that, um, you can slice up the college educated population, um, white males with college educations, uh, um, essentially, I think a majority of them voted for Trump. Um, it does moderate the tendency, um, but, um, but still among that demographic, um, um, uh, you would still see uh, uh, Trump winning in, in that even with college degrees there. The other thing to say about college degrees, how that, one of the ways that plays, and it's a similar phenomenon in Australia, is that, is that kids aren't going back home after they get their degree, um, not going back to a small town or to the or farming community, um, staying in a larger place, typically, uh, where, they, where they got their degree. Um, and that is a source of two things, um, um, of resentment, um, back in those communities, um, um, but also depopulation, frankly, and, and, and emphasising sort of a skills gap um, that I think the urban-rural thing is, is in large measure about, but not entirely. And then I'll go on to answer your second question, that is what decided the election, um, what was in people's heads? Um, um, <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> um, were they voting for Trump? I, I, I still, I haven't looked at this yet. I don't know anybody that's done a good job of looking at this. I still can't help but think part of the story in those, some of those states were people were lulled into a false sense of security by the polls. 
a bunch of Sanders people woke up on a Tuesday morning and said, I don't like her. I didn't vote for her in the primary, but she's got this and so it's okay because the polls are saying she's up in Wisconsin by three points or Pennsylvania. And um, I wonder if, if there's some demobilization that came from, from that. But note that the, what the preconditions are there, I don't like her, I voted for Sanders in the primary. And the polls are the, sort of the third thing in that chain of reasoning there. I think the first two have to be confronted um, in any sort of serious post-mortem of the election. Um, one of the smartest takeaways I've heard from the election, or smartest glib uh, takeaways from the election, uh, you've got to have an, a verb in your slogan. Right, making America great, right, right, versus stronger together. Um, um, part of the, 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 and I can't fault the Clinton campaign. Like after you, you, like after that hot mic Billy Bush video drops, you go, this thing is over. Like it's over, right? Um, and of course you're going to play, as we say in rugby, you're going to play the man, not the ball. At that point, you're going to go after Trump and his fitness for office. Um, so, in, you know, I think it's really, you've got to be very careful not to get engaged in too much Monday morning quarterbacking here, to use an American expression. Um, I, I, I tend to think they probably uh, played the right campaign. But, you know, was it a positive agenda that Trump had? Yeah, he talked about bringing jobs back to those places in a way that Clinton wasn't credible on. He talked about how free trade uh, has, has disrupted those communities in a way that no one, no one, no serious candidate had talked to them um, um, before. Um, so I think there's a, a bunch of people who knew exactly what they, what Trump was saying and, um, and, and were down with the program and, and got up and voted for the first time in 10, 12, 16 years. Um, um, and indeed, some of them maybe might have even voted for Obama. Um, and that leads to one last thing I'll say. There's a set of people out there in those communities, I think. I think, you know, Iowa, I saw some polling out of Iowa the other day, but, you know, I don't know. But my, this is based on a tiny bit of data, but more intuition than anything. Um, I'm not sure that for all the turmoil of the opening month of his administration, I'm not sure it's hurt him that much. In, in some of those rural, small town places in the upper Midwest and into the farm states. I think he's doing exactly, he is shaking things up. Um, and um, so there's some thoughts. I wish I had a better answer to what were they thinking um, when they voted for Trump, but that's my best stab at it. Yep. Uh, sir, just up here, and then we'll go over to the microphone over there. I'd like to ask you a question about the seeming uh, inherent instability of the populist parties uh, in Australia. So thinking of uh, One Nation, Catter's Australian Party and Palmer United Party. Uh, but the Queensland elections in about the year 2000, uh, One Nation did very well indeed. Right. And then split into two parties almost immediately. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you see the same thing in, inherently. They, they're there, then they, they, they split apart, uh, and then the vote just seems to go either to some other populist mm -hmm. party or back to the main mm -hmm. parties. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just comment on that general issue of instability, please? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think this is the flip side of, um, of the Westminster system. Um, ministerial leather exerts a tremendous discipline. On, on, on politicians. And you take that out of the equation uh, for the minor parties whose leverage is on the crossbench, essentially the temptation to be a free agent in that environment, right? that's, how you, that's your leverage, right? Versus sticking together as a group, right? It's, and it's easy, A, to be picked off or, or to get divided. Um, and, and one of the things about Hanson Mark II versus Hanson Mark I, is I think a, an understanding of the discipline that a serious political organisation entails um, that wasn't there and maybe because it sort of all happened so quickly and took them by surprise and they haven't been doing this for a century <laughs> like the Labor Party, like, uh, like conservative uh, parties uh, 
uh, under different names over, over the course of Australian political history. And understanding that you might be the government of the day, I think, imposes a, a discipline on a, on a political organisation that being a bunch of, being on the crossbench um, doesn't. The other thing is a commitment to a program, uh, having an ideology about the way the state ought to be run and what public policy, keeping the bastards honest only gets you so far. Um, um, and, and for Hanson, um, I think this will be a test. Uh, I, I fully expect, you know, if, if those Queensland numbers are even halfway true, um, it would be very interesting what, what position uh, Hanson party people hold in the next Queensland parliament. And, and if they're pivotal, then it's game on, right? And, and, um, and that will impose, I wonder if that will impose sort of some of this discipline ex post, um, if not ex ante. Um, um, and, and, but I think that's part of the story. We've got Another institutional story. We've got time for two questions, so we'll take the two questions up here. Of course, Australian National University. Thank you, Simon, for that excellent analysis of voting patterns uh, in 2016. Uh, I just wanted to take you back to your definitions of populism sure. because you associated populism with the belief that political leaders, political the political establishment is captured by big business and international financiers and so on and so forth. And of course, this wasn't true at all of the kind of populism that emerged in Australia in the 1990s, which Barry Hindus and I did a book about us and them, uh, <laughs> by the by, uh, which, which uh, was did, uh, the, did not include big business in the elites. So this is the kind of anti-elite discourse that was promoted by News Corp pu uh, publications, by talkback radio hosts, by John Howard indeed. So it was the battlers versus the elites, the elites who wanted to redistribute taxpayers' dollars and spend them on special interests like welfare beneficiaries and protection of the environment, indigenous Australians, all those things. So. Pauline Hanson in the 1990s was quite unusual insofar as she was an economic nationalist. Um, the, the, main, the mainstream of populism in the, 80, in the 1990s, the market populists, they weren't against globalisation, against the UN, but they weren't against globalisation. But Pauline Hanson, of course, did espouse economic nationalist anti-globalisation uh, uh, beliefs and, and has again. Uh, today. So there's a complexity there, I think, in, in Australian populism, which perhaps wasn't captured in your definitions. Well, that's fair enough. I, 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 I was holding those out as examples of the, the them um, that populists uh, seek to make uh, as, as political targets. But you're right about, about um, the, the, the version of it that we had in the 90s. Um, at least here in Australia, that's right. Uh, um, I, I guess she, she took aim, that's right, welfare recipients of whatever skin colour, um, but, um, um, but also the supporting, you know, she referred to an, uh, an Aboriginal industry, an Aborig you know, that, that sort of talk, and you know, that sort of was a little closer, I think, to what I was, you know, a, a technocratic, bureaucratic, conspiracy against the masses that perpetuates that. But fair, fair cop, I, I, I take the point. Just time for one, sorry, short question. Um, moderate success outside politics and not a professional politician. So uh, you've got Bob Hawke, Andrew Lee in Canberra, Malcolm Turnbull, Barnaby Joyce. In America, you've got uh, President Reagan, President Trump, but even in his first election, President Obama. Is there a... Uh, a swing towards, um, in both countries, at the leadership level or even local member level, people wanting actually a, a non-professional politician, but someone who's got a bit of competence and ex you know, uh, credible experience outside politics? Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't speak authoritatively on, on I don't have a, a, a data set on that, but, um, but certainly there are, those are very vivid uh, examples of late. Um, certainly the, the you know, this idea of the charismatic breakthrough leader, that's going to carry more authenticity to the extent someone does have that sort of career path, has, has, has established the runs on the board, if you will, 
um, uh, in another domain, um, Palmer. Um, Turnbull had been in politics a long time before he became Prime Minister, um, not as long as John Howard, but, but, but yeah, fair enough. Um, um, it's funny though, the system, like Schwarzenegger, <laughs> it was one, one and out, um, um, you know, didn't go on to, you know, 40 years in the US Senate or anything like that. Uh, uh, and, and I think Berlusconi um, in Italy, and, and we'll see about Donald Trump. <laughs> well, thank you, P Professor Jackman, for that very thought-provoking uh, lecture. Could you join me, please, in thanking Professor Jackman? Thank you. The next Senate occasional lecture will be in March. I can't remember the date off the top of my head, but it's around minor parties in the Senate again. So uh, you are cordially invited to attend that one as well. Thank you very much for coming, ladies and gentlemen.